Thank you. Well, we're going to be looking at a different type of series. I've never taught a series quite like this, so it'll be adventuresome for me as well as uh, for you who are listening. We're going to be looking at bad people in the Bible. But we're going to learn good lessons from the bad actions of those individuals. Some of them are going to be very familiar to you. Some are not going to be so familiar. But we're going to be looking at that and trying to discern from God's will and God's word what we can learn and how we can act and react accordingly to prophet God and glorify him. Uh, you can be turning in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 25. That's going to be our text for today. There's a story told about a group of atheists who were quite upset over the way uh, they were not being uh, treated well by our society. They said that all the uh, holidays that we have in our society, most of them, if not all, revolve around some form of godly endeavor and and tribute to God. And they felt very, very uh, hurt by that because they said we don't have a holiday uh, all the Christians have holidays Jews, Jews have a holiday we don't have a holiday so they got together they filled out a petition filed it with the court and went to the court to a judge and demanded that they be given a holiday along with everyone else at the conclusion of their argument, the judge looked at them and said, but you already have a holiday. And this took them back and they went, no, we don't. He said, sure you do. April 1st, April Fool's Day, for it says in the Bible, Psalms chapter 14, verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So of course you have a holiday. Well, in First Samuel, beginning in verse 1, of chapter 25, verse 1, it says, Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him at the home at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Haran. David is on the run from Saul, as you will recall from your previous study of the Old Testament. You know that uh, David was a friend of Saul. He was in, in Saul's court, uh, played music for Saul even, was a great friend of, his, of, his, of Saul's son, Jonathan. And now uh, things have changed. Saul has become angry. The, uh, Satan has entered Saul's heart. And now he wants to kill David. So David is constantly on the run. And our story begins with Samuel's death and David on the run. A certain man in in Moab who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep. And he went, that he was, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in all of his dealings. He was a Calebite. We're going to be looking at three different individuals in our story today, and how they reacted and acted, and how what effect this had on uh, God's people and godly people. Uh, Beginning with this individual named Nabal, and he'll be the star of the show, if you will. Nabal is very interesting how he's introduced. He is introduced by his property. Before you know his name, you know what he owns. 
that is not uncommon in our world today because there are people in our world that you hear about all their accomplishments, everything they own, everything they've done, before you even know their name. You've heard about their reputation in these areas. Now, the point being that usually when you're introduced that way, Whatever is used to introduce you is where your heart is. But where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. So when a man, a man or woman is introduced by his or her possessions, what does that tell you about the individual as far as the way society sees them? They don't see them as a what kind of character they have. They're first seen by, in our case, perhaps their education. Or their possessions, <coughs> or their accomplishments. Well, this was the case in with Nabal. Um, the word, the name Nabal, is translated from the word fool. Now, that's kind of interesting because I doubt that too many parents would intentionally name their child fool. But in this case, perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps Nabal wasn't really his given name, but a name that had been given to him later in life by those around him. <clears throat> as a, as we would call it a nickname. And perhaps that's how he came to have a name so interesting as Nabal when, when the word obviously means fool. And we'll find out through this story today that he definitely lives up to his name. Um, back in the day of, of uh, the Old Testament, names were given as a sign or a meaning. Um, with, they just didn't pick a name out of a hat. Instead, they uh, would go and find some characteristic, perhaps, and name their child in favor of that characteristic. I know in today, I've heard that in today's world, uh, the best way to name kids, they say, is unless you have a family connection, if you're just trying to figure out a name, they've said to go out in the front yard and start yelling names and whichever one you like to hear the best. Maybe that's what you should name your child because that's where you'll be using it the most is yelling at your children from the front yard. So that wasn't the way it was done in Bible times. That was the way it's done today. But the name meant quite a bit. All right. Now, it says that he was cruel, sorrow, and very unlikable. In other words, this is not a guy you'll be neighbors with, okay? This is an individual who is very um, ugly, if you will. I'm not, not a good person, doesn't have a good reputation, or the reputation he has is not good. And yet God says, um, I can use this person. I can use this person. I can use anyone. And God uses all mankind, whether they be good or bad. Now, the fact that God uses an individual does not mean in any shape, form, or fashion that God approves of the man or his actions. Simply that he can use whatever uh, situation is presented and he takes that individual and uses them for his good. Now it says that uh, he was a Calebite. Uh, if you remember, Caleb was one of the two individuals who was allowed to enter the promised land after the 40 year wandering for their lack of uh, belief in God. Joshua and Caleb were the two that came, to, came out of the wilderness and entered into and helped, <clears throat> helped to uh, conquer the land. And um, the part of the land that Caleb conquered was in the area of the tribe which will later be known as the tribe of Benjamin. Now we'll get to that in a moment. 
that will play a part in in this story and the way things work out. But please keep that in mind. The Bible says he was a Calebite and the area of the country that uh, Caleb conquered and was given in terms of uh, his possession of the land. All right, now, on the other side, you have Caleb, I'm sorry, you have Nabal with all of his um, cruelty and ugly dealings and all of that. On the other side, you have Abigail. And Abigail is said to be a very intelligent and a very beautiful woman. Perhaps, perhaps, if she was that intelligent and that beautiful, maybe this is a sign of prearranged marriages because she wasn't very intelligent to have married a man who is known later or then as a fool. But if the marriage was prearranged, she would really have had no choice to matter anyway. It wasn't a matter of picking and choosing. It was simply a matter of being the wife of the individual chosen as her husband. Um, now, as the story goes on, as you read through, we're not going to read all the verses because it would take too long. But as you go down through the chapter now, in uh, you'll find that David comes along. Now he's again he's running from Saul. <coughs> he's uh, constantly on the run, so he has no time to make provisions, get provisions, and things like that. So <coughs> he sends greetings to Nabal, and they're very warm greetings. Uh, he knows Nabal is there shearing the sheep. Sheep shearing was a big operation. Um, the closest thing, well, unless you're familiar with with uh, shearing of sheep, we don't have many sheep in this particular part of the country. But we do we do have uh, reference or knowledge about cattle, and you will remember when they would when they bring the cattle in and brand cattle. It would be sort of that idea. I mean, it was a, a celebratory time because uh, the the uh, the flocks and the herds were in abundance, and it took a long time, or several days, many days, to shear all the sheep, obviously, depending on the size flock you have. But it was, it was a working time when people worked, and yet they were joyful in their work because of what it represented to them. So it was a point in time that... Uh, David's band of men, and led by David, of course, had actually helped in watching over these sheep. Uh, the, the shepherds who needed a break. Uh, apparently, David's men were available. David offered to let his men stand guard over the flock of sheep while the, perhaps while the other people had a break. So David had done a favor, if you will, for this man Nabal without his asking for it. Nabal didn't ask for it at all, but David volunteered. And <clears throat> so as a result of doing this favor for the gentleman, uh, David asked a favor of him. And he asked him if there would be any way that he could bring uh help to his men. Help would include food, uh, perhaps uh, some type of clothing, maybe um, here or there, but an equal exchange for the effort that David had spent on Nabal's uh, flock. Uh, he sent his men, asked them, and it, it's a simple thing. I mean, you would, you're dealing with a very wealthy man here. He has much greater provisions than he will ever use. It's not like you're requesting something, uh, taking something he needs away from him. But the men go and they make their proposition to uh, Nabal. And in verse 10, it says, Nabal answered David's servants. 
Who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread to water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? Well, you can well imagine that David's men are a little bit taken back by this. Uh, they were expecting to be treated um, in kindness as they had done for Nabal and the, rest, the first statement he said is, who is this David? Now, Nabal knew who David was. There, there's no question. There's no doubt that he knew because later on in the story, um, his wife, Abigail, will refer to David as in a kingly way. They know. They both know who he is. And they both know who he represents. And yet, he has the audacity to say, who is David? Now, David is the anointed uh, king. He hasn't taken the throne because David and Saul is chasing him. But he was extremely well known throughout the land. Even before he got into the kingly position, he was... Uh, with, uh, he had already shown himself to be a warrior, and you remember the uh, the ladies that made up the song about David that said Saul has killed his thousands, and David is ten thousands. So this is not an individual that is obscure. He is extremely well known, but but instead of treating him like a would be king or one who is about to ascend to the throne, uh, Nabal says. How do I know it's out of a bunch of slaves? It just escaped. I don't want to be involved in in uh, giving back or helping slave runaway slaves. Now again, it is you've got to understand that there was no question that he knew who David was. So it's not a matter of saying, "Well, you, know, you poor guy, you know you you." You know, you could be an outlaw. No, he was the king, and everyone knew it. Um, now, was Nabal short on resources that he couldn't afford to share with this individual? And that's not true either. Uh, there were plenty of resources, he had plenty of um, necessary things that he could have shared with them. But it's his obnoxious character that gets in the way. It's the fact that he's just not a nice person to deal with. David's response was, was very interesting. When, there's, when the servants finished talking to David about what Nabal had said, Basically insulting. I mean, that, that, that's pure unadulterated insult to refer to the soon-to-be king of Israel as a runaway slave. Uh, it's hard to imagine. It doesn't sit well with David. He doesn't like to be insulted, as most of us would be the same way. So what does it say? What does the Bible say he did? He strapped on a sword. And he said, Well, I'll just take care of this problem. Uh, I've got I've got 400 men here. I think we can overtake this whole little group of folks. They're just out there shearing sheep. There's not any military presence there. And we can I can I can go and he promises, basically he promises. That when he gets there, Nabal will be dead, and so will all the men in, they, in Nabal's household. That's called flying off the handle. Okay? That's a <coughs> necessary. It's wrong. It's anger. Now he's not notice it's not about God. 
and God defending God's anger and actions. He's defending his own. He is mad because he's just been insulted. So we see Nabal has a response of, I'm not going to be involved in this. I don't even know who you are. Then I the whole thing. David, on the other hand, gives a different response to, the, to his actions, and that is, I'll get even. We'll just go over and take them out. We've got the power to do it. No, it won't be a problem. And that'll be the last time this guy Nabal doesn't give me the respect I deserve. So he gets ready to he gets ready to go and take out Nabal. Now, was David always this angry? Or was this always David's uh, uh, response? The answer is no, it couldn't have been. Because just a few days, weeks, months earlier, Saul is chasing David. David finds Saul in a cave asleep, and he has the ability to take him out. He has the ability to eliminate the problem. And his response, instead of eliminating the problem, is what? He goes over and cuts a piece of his robe off to indicate he's been there. And he leaves, and the men with him say, what kind of action was that? Why didn't you take him out? You have that's what the opportunity was there for. And David said, I will not kill the Lord, God's anointed. So David doesn't always respond in anger. David more, more often responds in a godly fashion of saying, No, let's be calm here. Let's calm down. Let's don't jump to conclusions. Let's don't act before we think. And we live in a world right now where people act before thinking. In fact, we have we live in a world right now where people basically in our society are not thinking much at all. There's very little thought going on. Godly or otherwise. It's reaction. You hit me, I'll hit you. You know, you do this, I'll do that. I'm going to stay one up, one up on you, or at least stay even with you. The Old Testament speaks of this kind of thinking all the time of revenge. Revenge never works. Vengeance never works. The reason being it has no end. There is, there is no point that Revenge quits until one family, one group completely annihilates the other one. But in the process, they become annihilated themselves because they've lost individuals in the same revenge war. We, when you think about it, uh, when you think about this kind of thing in our society in, uh, in America, you think about the stories about uh, the McCoys and the Hatfields that were uh, constantly feuding with each other. And if you remember the story, eventually someone gets in the middle and says, what, are, what is the feud over? And neither side can remember what it is. Because it's generations old, and they've just been doing it forever. Well, this is where you have to, you have to realize that um, vengeance won't get you what you want. So David is ready to go kill this man. Now one, his friend, well, more than his friend, his mentor, Samuel, has just died. He's on the run. He's probably hungry at this point. And all these factors shape his thinking. But that doesn't change anything. He still has no business doing this. So he is now ready to go and uh, deal with this individual. <coughs> A servant of Nabal's reports the incident to Abigail. Now she's a beautiful one who is intelligent. 
and she realizes the situation they're in. She uh, she understands that there's a man with a sword with hundreds of followers who is strict to come down and wipe out their entire family, if you will. And so she, instead of getting angry and siding with Nabal, her husband, she loved up provisions. If you want to bring somebody's wrath down, oftentimes giving them a gift is a good start. Uh, it's hard to be mad at somebody that's giving you things. So we have a situation where she loads up stuff and um, she realizes that um, her husband is wrong. Um, but if you notice very quickly how the servants react when they tell, when the servant tells Abigail, he doesn't seem to be surprised at Nabal's uh, actions because this apparently was the way he treated everybody. And the servant is only concerned because if they insult this man David and David should come down on them, the servant too will be killed. So it's in his best interest to try to find somebody that will listen to it. He finds Abigail and she does listen to it. Um, she doesn't question the servant. She doesn't say, oh, come on, now are you sure? Would he, yeah, you probably misunderstood. No, she's felt his wrath for a long time. And she knows exactly. He did say and do exactly what the servant said because that's just Nabal. So in verse 17, um, it, it indicates that Nabal is so wicked, no one can talk to him. I mean, he's past the point of reason. Now, what kind of person is past the point of reason? A fool. Foolish people are the ones who stop using reason. They stop thinking and they start acting. They start reacting. Their words betray them. Um, so she makes provision and she loads up the, the station wagon as it were to take the provisions to David to see if she can make peace and uh, she doesn't consult with Nabal. Now that's very unusual because in the time that we're talking about wives were in total subjection to husbands. Um, and the idea of doing something without your husband's permission or knowledge would be wrong. It goes against all society. Why didn't she talk to him? Like, well, Solomon will later say in the book of Proverbs that it's a waste of time talk to a fool. In other words, it may sound good, it may look good, but you're not going to accomplish anything because the fool is not even considering the reasoning that you have or the reason you're giving them. So she doesn't waste time with that. She she loads up the the, the uh, animals and heads toward the, where she believes David's going to be coming down. They're going to meet. That's what it's going to amount to. She wants to meet him on the road. Now, Abigail is a good ambassador of peace. She does everything well in terms of how do you negotiate, if you will, how do you negotiate with a fool or in, in, on the behalf of a fool in this case. So she goes and she, first of all, she brings a gift. As I say, you can win a lot of favor by bringing gifts when you need to make uh, statements to people. And uh, she met David on the way. In other words, she, took, she was proactive. She didn't just wait for David to get there to the gate or to the sheep, uh, to the sheep pen or whatever and say, oh, wait a minute, I've got something to talk. No, she can't afford to wait that long because she knows the mindset of David. 
or what he's likely to be. So she goes proactively out to David. And she meets him on the way. She honors him and gives him respect that he deserves. Uh, in verse 24 and following, uh, she uses words uh, like uh, sir and refers to him as king later on. Um, she's giving him the respect that he deserves and should have gotten from Nabal instead of getting to this point. But that's where we're at. So she gives him that. And notice how she approaches David. She doesn't come to him yelling and screaming and all this kind of thing. I'm not, you, know, you can't do this, you're wrong. Uh, I need my husband protected. No, she very calmly and very coolly offers her respect. In Proverbs 15 and verse 1, Solomon will say later on that a soft, a soft answer turns away wrath. And that is so true. It's very hard to argue with somebody who's being kind. We like to ramp up our arguments. We like, we, we expect people to get angry. We expect people to, to in, our, in our society, to use words that we wouldn't use when they're angry. And those same people who use that kind of language and use that type of thing will also expect you to do the same. They're expecting you to respond in line, in line kind of the same kind of language, same kind of words, and when you don't, when you say, yes, let's talk about this. Yes, sir. Roger, I like um, uh, Philippians 4 and 5, so let your, let your gentleness be evident to all. Right. Let your gentleness Absolutely. be evident to all. Absolutely. The gentleness of an individual brings down the boiling point. Um, anger is like a pot of boiling water. The hotter you get, the faster it boils. So the gentle answer and the gentle um, response turns down the heat. When you turn down the heat, the water goes down. The boiling point's not as high. If you, if we respond in kind and we yell and scream at them, the way they're yelling and screaming at us, it just raises the temperature higher and higher and higher. So eventually somebody does something really stupid. Okay? But if you respond in a dignified way, in a godly way, as Abigail did here, all of a sudden you start to see things begin to change. Uh, now notice one thing real fast, and that is that uh, in this section, beginning with verse 24, uh, Abigail concedes that Nabal was a fool. That's, that's simple. You're right, David. My husband is a genuine idiot. Okay? I know that, you know that. Okay, we're, we're in agreement. I'm not going to. I'm not going to defend bad behavior. Have a go say, you're right. And of course, the minute you start agreeing with the individual, you start to bring peace. That has to be agreement on something that's true. But in this case, it was. So if I were going to say, now let me say, my husband's just a good old boy, and I'm, you know, what well, made David even matter? But instead, she goes, you're right. Your, your, your assessment of my husband is absolutely correct. Um, now, uh, notice that she refers to uh, her gift to David as opposed to, I'm giving this to you because I have no choice. I'm, I'm fearful of you. I'm afraid, I'm afraid of what you're going to do, so I'm handing you this stuff to try to appease you. No. She says, I'm she referred to it as a gift. I chose to put this stuff together and I chose to give it to you. And there again, you're giving, you're, you're not coming across as someone with no choice, therefore you do what you have to do 
but you you still remain in a, in the state of being able to make a decision, and I choose it because I want to. I like you, Dayton. I want to. I want to work with you as opposed to against you. Um. She praises David. Now that's a good way to get a piece in the family, and that is to give genuine praise. And I'm not not flattery. Flattery won't work. It has to be something genuine. But she praised David because she says, "You fight. You're the one who fights the Lord's battles without uh, needlessly shedding blood." In verses 28 to 31. I know you're a, you're a great warrior. But you're a warrior who knows and respects their enemy and tries to avoid bloodshed if possible. We try to work out a peaceful solution first. Abigail hears, I'm sorry, David hears Abigail's plea and the tone that she presents it in and the logic that she gives it. And he relents on his promise to kill Nabal. She convinces him that it isn't necessary to kill Nabal. Even though he's a fool. Even though he's, he said all the wrong things at all the right times and all the wrong places. He begins to go, you're wrong. I am wrong. My anger overtook me. And he eventually praises Abigail in this same section for keeping him from shedding innocent blood. Now, I'm not sure that he considered Nabal's blood to be innocent, but certainly the servants, all the men around Nabal, were not in agreement with him necessarily. And he would have killed, he was going to kill everybody, all the men. Centuries later, on the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, it reads, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they <coughs> are called the children of God. God intends for his children to be people who are trying their best to create peace. Of course, we understand from a Christian standpoint that the peace that we offer Mankind is not only with each other, but we have the ability to un and are under uh, direct orders, as it were, from God to tell people about how they can achieve peace with God. We're peacemakers when we preach the gospel. When we tell people what they must do to be saved from the wrath of God, we are actually working in making peace. Verse 36. When Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until daybreak. No point wasting time talking to a drunken fool. It'll serve no purpose. Just wait till he sobers up and we'll talk to him then. He'll sober up and he won't, be, he won't lose the fact that he's a fool, but uh, he will at least be sober. Then in the morning when Nabal, Nabal <coughs> was sober, his wife told him all these things and he, his heart failed him and he became <coughs> like a stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. David didn't have to kill Nabal to get vengeance because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. In this case, he got vengeance for David and took out an evil man with probably a heart attack. But, uh, Apparently, that's what it was. Now, David was wrong when he wanted to try to kill Nabal. 
that was not God's will. But when God gets ready for a man to die, a man will die. God does not need my help. Now, if God tells me to do it, as he often does in the Old Testament did, he used his people to take out other people and other nations. But until he gives the order, don't do it. In the world we live in today, God does not give us direct orders as to who to kill and who to leave alone. So our job is not to punish the wicked on this earth. Our job is to try to bring the wicked to an understanding of Jesus Christ in the first place. And in so doing, and by the way, when I say wicked, you understand that God views all men who are not part of his, his family as sinners, lost, and thus wicked. So even if it's a goodly, godly looking person who does not acknowledge Christ as his Lord and Savior and has not put him on baptism, God considers him an enemy. And we are to go and to talk to those individuals and to bring them to an understanding of Christ, if at all possible. Continuing then, um, when David heard the name of that he said, praise be the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong, that's David, and brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. His servant went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent for you to take you to become his wife. She bowed down with the face of the ground. I am your servant and am ready to serve you and wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and attended by her five female servants, went with David's messengers, and became his wife. So we see at the end of the story, uh, it all works out. I mean, this, this is one of those stories where the right people win, the right people lose, and, and Abigail gets to become the, a wife, not the wife, but a wife of the potential king of Israel, and David gets a beautiful and intelligent woman as his wife. Uh, works out very well for everybody concerned except for Nabal, but Nabal was the fool. So we learn, we've learned some lessons, hopefully, from the story, and we learn that we should not be a part of the fool as Nabal did. It doesn't pay off well. So I appreciate your time. If you want to begin thinking about it next week, I believe next week's lesson is going to be on Ananias and Sapphira, which is over in the book of Acts. So you're going to read, on, read that ahead of time. That'll be great. And we'll look at we'll look at those two individuals and see what we can learn from them next week. I thank you for your time. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Roger, I've forgotten just what was the end story of Abigail. Have you read, read the one? The one. Uh, of Abigail. Uh, isn't she the one? Uh, I don't know. That, I don't know if there's much more about her other than she is the one of the wives. One of the wives. I don't. I. I don't remember her playing much of a role. Of course, David's got so many wives that she gets kind of lost in the shuffle, I suppose. But um, I don't. I don't recall. I'll, I'll look at that and see. But I don't recall any other much more information about her. Probably a curiosity. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Roger. I had forgotten that Rachel died in childhood. Do what?